we want to create a product can comfort our, our children whenever the children is not feeling well. We got like 10% manuka honey, so we got like more honey and ginger, so the taste is quite, quite good. Right? Welcome back to another episode of A Kiwi Original. Today on the show, I'm joined by Lily Ma, who is the director for the company Manudi Plus Manuka Honey Sweets. These are the lozenges and the lollipops that not only Kiwis enjoy, but many of our export markets are very familiar with this brand in Australia, in the US and in China. And today we're going to be talking about how Lily got started with the business and what they've been up to since. So first of all, welcome on the show, Lily. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me today. You are welcome. So let's start with the product you've got in your hand there. because It's quite an unusual looking package. What what went into the design considerations of, of making these lollipops in a package that's that's hexagonal in size? Actually, we spent a lot of time at the very beginning to design this package um, because you know there are different manuka honey lozenges and lollipops in the market already. So to stand out. We we spent a lot of time and also to get people's ideas about the package. So so at the end, that's how it turned out. And that one you're holding up, it's got a kiwi fruit on the front. So I'm guessing that is the manuka kiwi fruit flavored lollipops. Is that right? That's right. We got four lollipops with different flavors and two lozenges. And whenever we go to an express uh, show, a trade show, we bring our brochure so people can see right away. You can also see from the background so people know which one is which. That's also the shape of our package. And out of those different ones there, Lily, what's the most popular flavor when you're selling these in New Zealand, for example? In New Zealand, the most popular one are the strawberry one and kiwi fruit one. Strawberry and kiwi fruit. And does that, uh, those preferences, do they change for the overseas markets? Of course. Like, um, we start our product launch in the US last year. So far, ginger flavor has been the most popular one in the US market. It's quite different. I've tasted the ginger one and it is very different. Is that, do you think that's because it's uh, it's less sweet? It's got more of a, like it's more complex taste with the ginger and the sweetness of the honey? Uh, yes. I think the most important thing for our product uh, is we got like 10% manuka honey and the manuka honey grade is 200, NGO 250 plus which currently is kind of the highest in the market. So we've got like more honey and ginger, so the taste is quite quite good, right? So when you're tasting one of these lollipops, you're actually getting not just good honey, but a good quantity of honey um, per lollipop or lozenge. That's right. What got you into this business originally, Lily? Um, the original purpose to create this brand is it's actually started with like two kiwi moms, uh, both with two children. We want to create a product can comfort our, our children whenever the children is not feeling well, cold or sick, so they can be a little bit happier. And uh -huh. we want to, yeah, to have a healthy and good taste product. And so this product is, is it, is it kind of a treat or is it more of something that if your child's not feeling well, you, you'll give them something that, that's, uh, that's got the manuka in it, but it's also got a bit of a treat as well. Yes, definitely. It's a treat and it's also a comfort and healthy uh, snack. And talk me through, take me back to that, that moment when uh, you first launched this series of, of products. Um, what was the, the feedback like internationally when you started exporting these? Uh, 
Um, actually, the business started in 2016, about four years ago. But like I mentioned before, we spend a lot of time on the product development, also on the package. So the product is not launched until September 2017. Um, with uh, the first market launched was definitely New Zealand. But New Zealand, as you know, is a small market. Uh, so to sell the product internationally, every year, like since 2017, we attend different like international organic and health product show, trade show, to, to promote our product. Like uh, at the very beginning, when the product launched in September 2017, we attended the Vita Food Asia in Singapore to promote the product. And we were lucky in that show, we found a, a Singapore distributor so they can import, we export to Singapore. Yeah, it was a very good start. Because those shows, when you go to them, sometimes they can be hit and miss, but you only need one really good relationship to make the whole show worth it. Um, how did you go about choosing the right distributor? How do, how do you know that um, that the out of all the people who want to resell your products that you've that you've got the right one? What are the the things you look for? Uh, I think you really have to look at what other products the distributor has been selling. If your target market is their current target market, if they're already like selling a lot of like this kind of uh, children or mom is the main buyer for their product, that's the right one. Okay, so you're looking for people who already understand the, uh, the market of parents, uh, with children, let's say, uh, up to the age of three. Does it work in reverse? Is there a, an opportunity then for you with these existing channels you've set up to actually help other Kiwi businesses get their products into markets that they're not currently in? Of course, I think so. Because like so far, we already attended uh, exhibition in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in the US. Um, because this gives us the opportunity to meet with different distributors in different countries. A lot of them, like like one time last year in the U.S., people asked us if we have a solo distributor in one country. We said, yes, we have already. But they say, do you have other products that we can sell, New Zealand-made products? So I think in general, New Zealand have a very good image globally. Um, the 100% pure, pure New Zealand, that slogan and image is really is a plus for, for international buyers. A lot of people have somehow across that ad in the airport or in the shopping mall. So, so people ask us if we have other New Zealand make health or organic products that they can buy from us. It just shows you the importance, doesn't it, of having a, a good reputation for your country because it enables then businesses to trade off that reputation like you are with the lozenges and the lollipops. Yes, it, ha it really helps a lot. Like last year in the US, a health and organic product show when people saw the poster on our booth, uh, they said, oh, lollipop. Oh, New Zealand made lollipop. Oh, New Zealand made Manuka honey lollipop. So they stop instantly and ask for sample to taste. Isn't that interesting? Like, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And people keep, stay and talk to you, say that, oh, New Zealand is so far away. <laughs> I always want to travel to New Zealand and I've been there. It's a beautiful country. You know, the talk, the country itself is actually a great talking point to start with. Ah, so that opens the, the conversation. Excellent. Exactly. And um, what's, how, how much time do you spend uh, between New Zealand and the markets you're exporting in? Usually, um, uh, this is kind of pre, 
pre-COVID-19? Pre-COVID-19, it's about two to three months overseas, like for different exhibition shows. We try to attend like two large internationally uh, like trade show every year. But now this year, we are actually already registered for the September U.S. show in Philadelphia again. But who knows if, if it will be canceled or not. Not sure yet. Haven't received any email yet. And I think, you know, I really feel for businesses that make their, their future connections and trade through these uh, trade shows because sometimes you need to meet the people behind the business and actually physically try the product. It's quite hard to do that via Zoom. Uh, I mean, sure, you, you know, we're, we're meeting right now and I know that you know, you've sent me products in the past, so I have tasted these and it's easy for me to, to talk about them. Um, mm -hmm. But what would be the plan if you can't get on a plane to Philadelphia and you, know, you still want to open up the, the U.S. market further? What's the, the backup plans to being able to do that? Um, I think you have to know the market a little bit, do some research, try to find out who are the big distributors in that country. Um, then send them email, introduce yourself. And if you're lucky and you find the procurement people, the right people, then send some some samples to them. So you've, you've got to have a thick skin. That's a lot of getting a lot of no's in your face to get a few yeses as well. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I, I had that many, many times. But sometimes it's really like, um, that's why it's important to attend the show. You can tell the procurement staff that, someone from your company uh, really like our product and he or she referred us to you and we'd like to talk more. And if you like, we send some samples, this kind of thing to start with. Actually, for our current U.S. distributor, we met their company people at the show. And later on, they are the ones who came back to us and told us that uh, their branch in Sydney, the, the procurement staff actually saw our products in one of the pharmacy in Auckland, and they like it. When they spoke to the U.S. team, the U.S. team, oh, why don't you just contact them in Auckland? So that's how we started last year. How important is it to have products on the shelf in New Zealand? Because um, I hear there's, there's two schools of thought. One is that uh, the market is small, so just go straight overseas. And the other is, if you're not on the shelves here, you're not seen as a as a real, authentic New Zealand brand. You're just seen as an export brand. Um, where where do you sit on that spectrum of opinions? Uh, I think it's very, very important to sell in New Zealand as a New Zealand-made product. Um, our uh, we 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 are. We actually visit a lot of shops, like pharmacy shops in New Zealand, try to promote our product. But I think uh, we're lucky because New Zealand is a tourism country, and our product is a good souvenir shop. It's a good gift uh, to, to, to be sell in the souvenir shop or the gift shop. So we so far we launched in more than about 150 stores in New wow. Zealand, and we are also the only uh, Manuka honey uh, lozenge lollipop selling as the Kipapa souvenir souvenir shop in Wellington. Yeah, because it's 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 a good good eye catching gift idea. It is. It, it looks different, and when uh, when you open it up, it's not just one lozenge or two. There's there's a whole lot of lozenges yeah. in there. So if you're taking it home to your to your friends and family, you get to hand a whole lot of them out at least a couple of times, and there's still probably a few left over for yourself. So you can buy for your for your mom, for your dad, for everyone in the family. We've got poplis, ginger, uh, lemon. Kiwi fruit, black carrot, strawberry. It's, it's a treat for everyone. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. This won't 
take long, subscribe to the show, and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. And so these are available at pharmacies currently. That's the, the main place that Kiwis would be able to, to pick up the lozenges and lollipops. Um, actually, for the moment, the most places that the, all the souvenir shops, like Otira, and we launched in many shops in Queenstown. Yeah. So when they're on their domestic uh, tourism campaign to, to see our backyard, uh, make sure to, to look out for them in the Queenstown souvenir shops. Now, these are these are manufactured in New Zealand. Um, Auckland. In, in Auckland. When, do, when would you decide that you needed another flavor, for example? You know, how, how do you know um, when, when tastes are changing or, or maybe, um, because the, the, I guess what I'm getting at here is when I went to China last year, it seemed that uh, there is this huge appetite for new and that if you have a very good product, that's fine. But six months later, that same set of consumers wants, what's the new thing? What's the next thing? Do you have to think about new flavors and, and the next thing, even though your current products are doing well? Uh, you're absolutely right. Like this one, our flat carrot one is the newly one we launched last year. Mm, I think once you have a solo distributor or a big distributor, they, they, they want to always have like new products. So people like to try new things. I, I think repeat customer is also very, very important. You sometimes you just have to say, okay, let's wait. Let's let, let, let do it step by step. Actually, we, the, the distributor want, wanted us to launch two or three more. At the end, we say, let's just do this one first. Then that step. You, I, I, you have to control your pace. Yeah, because there's the you have to balance the sales with how much you produce and the revenue versus the costs. But I can see it from the distributor's perspective. If they take your, let's say your uh, Manuka lozenges with ginger and it goes, it sells out uh, at all their stores, of course, they're going to start pushing you for more products that are different because they need to sell you know, volume rather than just focus on one product. Um, yeah. how, how competitive is it in the, the China market? What are the, the differences between, say, China and uh, Australia when you're trying to get your products on the shelves there? Uh, I think, like, China is, like, so big. Um, you, there's no way you can have, like, everywhere. The, the important thing is to have one capable distributor. They will do everything. But for the Australian market or the U.S. market, a lot of the time, the distributor, they don't want to be the solo distributor. Because normally for solo distributor, there is a quantity requirement for every year. We, we, go, we both agree one number. But for Australian a U.S. market, people will think, okay, I will try to sell and see how it goes. So, like, if you don't find, like, solo distributors. They, they will just try first and see how it goes. So you know a lot about this, Lily. I'm going to ask, how did you learn all of this? Because there's no manual at university that teaches you all of these <laughs> different things. Um, what, what's your background? How did you become an expert at this? My background actually has nothing to do product development or export. Um, I, I did my bachelor in tourism degree at Lincoln University in Christchurch. And later on, I got my diploma in hotel management in Switzerland. My my hotel school was uh, Eco Delia at the Lausanne. Is a uh, I did I my background is actually in hospitality and tourism, but but you know who knows what may happen in your life. 
Um, I moved back to New Zealand in 2016 with two children. My little, my elder, sorry, my little girl was only like one year old. So I have to stay at home as a full-time mom. But, but at the same time, I want to do something. So me and my other good friends, we met in uh, uni in New Zealand. Like we've, we've been like best friends for 20 years. We say like, okay, um, we have to do something. And we want something good for our children and healthy uh, products that last to be that, to be simple. Yeah. So we've been like learning during the during the process, learn a little something each something new every day. It's really a hard but good journey. At the very beginning, we both agree that if we fail. We just consider as master degree and B class tuition. <laughs> so we have a very good. We're quite positive. I like, I love to hear that because you're you're taking a couple of things that are natural skills to you, which is you've got a long standing friendship that you can then really trust your co founder, uh, which is not that. Um, that easy to find in life. And then the second thing is you've got this basis of hospitality and tourism skills, which are actually just people skills and people skills do really well in IT and they also do very well in sales. And so you've, you've, I know you've got that, I can sense that from you. So it makes sense that, uh, you know, you're, you're putting that to the test and doing a, a MBA in real time a very practical one because when you get a yes, you know that's good, and when you get a no, you know that you've got to pick up the phone or, or email someone else. Yeah. So where do you want to take the business from here? What's the what's the plans, and and if they're successful in a year or two, you know what what would that look like for you? Um, I think we in the long term we're going to develop different products. Our big um, brand is Phanology and Manudi is actually the first brand under Phanology. And the name for Manudi Plus is actually Manuka Honey Candy. Plus is plus different flavor. Got it. So Manuka and Candy. Yeah, Manuka Honey Candy, Manudi. So in the long term, we would like to to develop more New Zealand made products, to sell New Zealand made, and to let people in the world enjoy New Zealand made. Well, I'm very happy that uh, you're a, a license holder, part of our New Zealand made group, and that that's part of the, the future vision for the brand. Certainly, New Zealand needs uh, as many export partners as we can get. We are a small nation that relies on trade. so. Certainly with yours and your business partner's skills, that's helping contribute to that. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you about, Lily, that, that we should be covering before we finish up? I think if you want to sell your New Zealand made products internationally, you really have to be careful with, uh, with uh, uh, nutrition information and also the barcode. Like for us, we, 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 at the very beginning, we didn't really use GS1 barcode and we just select whoever pop up first on Google and pay. But later on, when we export overseas, people questioning us why New Zealand made products not start with knife four. Knife four is always the New Zealand barcode, the first two digits. So later on, we have to change. To, to make sure people, when they see it's New Zealand made, although we have the New Zealand made logo, but you know, all the distributor knows the barcode numbers. And also the nutrition information, each country has very different regulations regarding to how you write it, what need to be there. So when we sell to the US, for example last year, we have to put on the US speaker. For the 
nutrition information. But now, because the order is big, so we printed the the whole whole series the whole range. of yeah the the p- p- products for new for U.S. market to meet U.S. FDA standards. There's a lot of complexities, isn't there? Even with a a range of the you know the six products I'm looking at behind you. That one change means you've got maybe 18 different SKUs just for those six. So if you're introducing yeah. one more, you're actually introducing three more. It's uh, not easy. No, because I think during the way, if you want to export, you really have to pay attention to all the things I just mentioned. Otherwise, you just keep printing new packages. It's, it's because every country has different regulations. Unless you don't want to sell internationally, if you do, you have to really consider all the details in long term. Well, I, I really like that you've got the New Zealand made logo not only on the back next to the barcode, but also it's it's on the front. So uh, your overseas consumers can see, ah, oh, this is the Kiwi, this is New Zealand made. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Lily. I really appreciate your insight into the trade relationships you've set up, how you've gone about that, the products themselves, and the the fascinating approach you've taken to making sure that your branded product stands out. And I think it's really interesting for a business that maybe has a complementary product to yours who is wanting to actually export into Asia uh, but doesn't have any of those links, maybe to collaborate with yourself that's going to open up some opportunities for them uh, if they're watching this yes we love to talk to different brands see their uh, possibility that to launch their products in our existing distributor absolutely it's certainly uh, something that it is a long road and if you want to export it does take time effort getting details right building those relationships uh, and making sure the products actually fit for purpose for the, the consumers that you want to sell to. And uh, as you've already mentioned, it's different for different countries. You know, America's taste buds are different from uh, China's. And, and you've got to think about what you're going to send to those distributors to make sure that they can then on sell your products. Yes, because the taste preference is really different from country to country. Sometimes you not only have to change the package, but also the taste. So that takes those 18 SKUs to maybe 30 or 40 then. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, good luck on your journey. And uh, I appreciate you uh, being so generous with your time this afternoon and uh, look forward to tasting some of the new products uh, when they uh, launch to market. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me today. You are welcome. Thank you, Lily. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, The New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, The New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade. We'll see you on the next episode.